Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. We're after lunch. Um, so I hope you guys are interested in tannins. Um, I'll quickly tell you a little bit about myself, uh, just to kind of let you know um, about the stellar tannin thing. My background's research. I tend to, I, I've worked in the wine industry, and then I really actually had a, a long career in uh, higher education, uh, as well as the Australian Wine Research Institute, just focused on uh, phenolic chemistry. That's been my research expertise, uh, both looking at phenolic development in grapes, how we can manage phenolics in grapes, as well as in the winery. And so uh, uh, when I was given an opportunity to work for polyphenolics, um, it seemed, seemed like the perfect thing for me because polyphenolics is a business that really is, is focused on trying to develop uh, phenolic products uh, that are, uh, can be used in the industry. And so uh, we sell products to the supplement industry. Uh, so we produce and develop phenolic molecules that have biological activity, and we actually run them through human clinical studies, and we sell to the industry um, primarily on the supplement side. I was really happy when uh, uh, the company said, yeah, we should uh, take some of this phenolic knowledge and develop a line of wine tannins based along your research. And so um, that's great because it gets me back into the wine industry where my real passion is. And so I, um, I worked with folks at, uh, at the facility to develop a line of products that we think are uh, add, add a uh, fill a gap that exists currently. And I'll tell you that about that in this talk. So um, I tend to be very informal. If you guys have any questions, you want me to explain things, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, my background is instruction, so uh, this is kind of, I love being in front of you guys, so ask me as many questions as you want. Um, with this talk, I, I always like to uh, take it from the perspective of, I want to teach you guys as much as I can about tannins and how, how they uh, can be used. Perhaps more importantly from the wine side, it's mouthfeel quality. Um, trying to understand mouthfeel quality, what is mouthfeel? And just to help tell you that, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm here to sell tannins or try to get you motivated about my tannins. But in a lot of applications on, in terms of optimizing wine quality, sometimes tannins aren't the right thing. Um, and so I've, um, fortunately on the tannin world, if you think about tannins and where they come from, uh, there's so many places we can manage tannins. And so I think it's great if uh, you guys, in the course of your production practices, if you can manage tannin quality as early as possible, that's the way to do it. And so I'm hoping out of this talk, you can get some ideas on what you can do uh, to think of from a tool and toolbox perspective. Sound good? So you all have this talk in your, um, in your, um, in your uh, folder. So the general outline, I'm going to tell you a little bit about wine production, uh, grape, starting with the grape berry and what we think of from the grape berry and what we're trying to get out of that grape berry when it comes to wine production. Uh, we'll talk about tannin extraction and wine composition. And then we'll get into tannins themselves, talk about the chemistry of these tannins. Um, recognize that some of you probably have not taken any chemistry classes, so um, the, I'll, I'll walk you through it, but um, you don't need to understand other than why, why these are important. Um, drivers of perception. Tannin's important. Don't get me wrong, tannin's absolutely important. It tends to be the focal point that we think about when we think about red wine tannin structure. But remember that uh, there's a lot of other things that uh, really make those tannins good, and it's not tannins. So I always think of tannins as the backbone of a wine. And then it's the flesh that is critically important too. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Well, then we'll move into the vineyard. Um, tannins are one of the best things in a wine um, in the sense that um, you can manage them almost virtually at every stage of uh, production, right? Manage them in the vineyard, you can manage them in the winery, you can manage them in, certainly in the cellar, and you can even manage them in the bottle. Um, and so there, tannins are constantly evolving. And so we'll talk through some of the management strategies that you might take both in the vineyard and in the winery to optimize tannins. And hopefully that kind of naturally leads into the products that I'm going to present to you. Now the products that I'm going to present to you are really built upon a career of research and trying to understand what are some of the gems that have come out of my research projects that I can use to optimize in terms of product development. Any questions so far? So. I'm a former professor, so if you guys don't ask me questions, I start asking you questions. <laughs> so just heads up. Um, all right, first question. No, I'm kidding. Um, 
So when we think about red wine production, definitely look at the grape berry and try to think about that grape berry in terms of what you want in your wine, okay? And so from the skin tissue, the pulp and the seeds, we bring in different th attributes to the wine, right? So the skin brings color for most grape varieties. Um, and then the tannins, and then there's some other components here that are important if you start really drilling down into trying to understand how grape production practices, for example, might be related to wine quality. You might look at some target molecules here. The pulp, virtually uh, the bottle of wine, the, the volume of that wine is very much pulp driven, right? Smaller berries, you, you tend to have more emphasis from the skin and the seed because there's not as much from the pulp. But the volume is, there's all that's where most of the volume is at in the pulp. Hydroxycinamic acids and certainly the sugars for the fermentation, and then the tannins in the seed. So when we just focus on tannins, tannins come in the skin, they come in the seed, and they uh, come in the stem if you, if you opt to include stem tissue in your fermenter. Those compartments, whether it's a seed, a skin, or a stem, have very different types of tannin in them. All right, so same basic class of molecules, but as we move into some of these sensory components, you'll realize that a skin tannin uh, in some ways behaves differently than a seed tannin behaves differently than a stem tannin, okay? Yes, ah, oh, freaking awesome. Seed, yeah, yeah. And one of the primary drivers that I'll talk about with tannins in general is size. Uh, size tends to drive a lot of sensory properties in wine, and stem tannin is very much more seed-like in terms of its size distribution. So is that bigger or smaller? It tends to be on the smaller size. And it's stem tannin, um, they, they t any bitterness that you find in a wine is almost always seed-derived. Um, to stem things, whether the decision includes stems or not, is generally not driven by the tannin, it's driven by the lignification of the stem, which may be green to characters to the wine. And so it can provide some spice to wine, um, so that's why people would want to add stem tissue to it, un unless you're doing whole cluster ferments or something like that. If there's a conscious decision to include stems for that reason, is to try to elevate spiciness, but at that point, you're looking for lignified stems, not green stems. And the tannin just kind of goes along for the ride. Uh, wine composition, uh, we're going to talk about this everything else thing. So, but I just wanted you to be thinking about the vast majority of the wine is water and ethanol. And um, everything else is what separates a $200 bottle of wine from a $5 bottle of wine, OK? I'm, my research area, this is everything else. Uh, my research area is on this purple area, phenolics. So generally, phenolics are some of the most abundant minor attributes in a wine, but they're some of the easiest to manage. They're generally present in parts per thousand concentration, so anthocyanins and tannins. These are parts per thousand concentration components. When you get into flavors and aromas, a lot of those compounds are parts per million, parts per billion, even parts per trillion in the case of, say, methoxypyrazines. So from a management standpoint, those are a lot harder to manage because they're such vanishing small concentration, quite potent for the concentration that they're at. Um, phenolics, that's it, okay? So this is just a, a, a review that um, was put out by uh, Andy Waterhouse, a professor at UC Davis, looking at different phenolic components in a wine. And here we have the phenolic class in a white wine and a red wine, young wine versus an aged wine. And the box here very much is what we call tannins. Um, and it points out some of the different names that are given to tannins. Uh, Proanthocyanidin, if you read any chemical journals or AJEV or something, it is often re these compounds are often referred to as proanthocyanidins. Um, condensed tannins, that's a specific type of tannin that is a grape-based tannin. There's oak tannins. Those are not condensed tannins. So con condensed tannin is very much a grape-derived tannin. Question. Yes? Where it says age, is that in the bottle or in the bottle? I would imagine it's in the bottle. But I, I don't know for sure. Um, so you can see if you just focus on the tannin component, white wine versus red wine, white wine's lower than red wine. Why is that? Yeah, 
you don't, there's no skin contact, right? And that's where all the tannin is located. So you can just see, you've eliminated the skins, the seeds, and the stems. You're not going to get any tannin, or very little tannin. Um, so clearly the big difference, okay? Red wines, this has 750 to 1,000. I don't know specifically why you'd have an aged wine having more tannin in it. I suspect it's just the sample set that they looked at had more tannin in it. Um, but we can get tannins. We just measured some, a study recently where we could get up to three grams per liter of tannin in some cases. So remember that your target is a winemaker. Regardless of the concentration of tannin in the wine, one of the goals of a winemaker is to make a balanced wine. So how do you balance a low tannin number versus a high tannin number? A lot of that's matrix, right? Uh, so how do, you, how do you build the flesh around that tannin so that at the end of the day it's still a palatable product. So let's talk tannins for a while. We'll come back to the rest of it. Why are tannins important? Most of us look at the bottom and think, okay, it's, it's important from a texture and body standpoint. Increases fullness, astringency, and so on and so forth. But tannins are actually important in a lot of other areas. I've got this broken out in terms of how you might approach a wine. All right, you, how your senses approach a wine. You tend to visualize it first, you smell it, you taste it, and then you evaluate the retronasal flavor aspects, and then you kind of have an assessment of how that um, mouth feel comes in your wine. It tends to be approached from that perspective. And tannins are pretty much important in all those areas. From a color standpoint, tannins are critically important to red wine color stability. Okay, if you have a lot of color in a new red wine, but you don't have tannin in that wine, you'll find that that color is going to quickly orange and yellow, all right? And so you see that in rosés. Rosés, you get some color, but there's not a lot of tan to support that color, and those rosés can go from a pink to a salmon to an orange rather quickly. And so you don't have the ability to stabilize that color, and so the stability of that color is very much dependent on the color themselves. In a, in a red wine system, that color reacts with tannin, and the, tan the color that exists after a year in the, in the barrel or two years is very different than the color that existed in that wine when it was brand new, all right? That color starts to react with the tannin itself. On the aroma side, um, hopefully some of these wines that we look at today, you'll see some aroma differences. All that was done to these wines was the addition of a tannin. And what you'll see is that tannin has the ability to modulate aromas in wine, um, and so, that can become important from a white wine standpoint, as well as in red wines. If you're looking at final stages of wine production, your aroma profile is not exactly where you want it to be. Oftentimes a tannin trial is warranted to see if you can change that profile to get. Taste. Um, tannins give two sensory properties in themselves. If you actually isolate purified tannins and put them in your mouth, you tend to be, describe tannins in two ways. They're bitter and they're astringent. And that's it. So bitterness is very much attributed to a very low molecular weight tannins. If you think about taste, bitterness is a taste response. Taste responses, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. And I think a sixth one or something just came out. Um, but to, in order for you to taste something, there are taste receptors in your oral cavity. So a compound has to satisfy a certain geometrical arrangement in order for you to taste it as such. And so tannins, by nature, have to satisfy a certain geometrical property, and one of those principal components is size. And so by nature, it has to, a small, ha, tannin has to be small in order for you to perceive it as bitter, okay? Once you get to a certain size, it won't fit in the receptor anymore, it's just astringent, okay? Um, we talked about aroma and flavor. There's a, those are two closely associated things. Aroma tends to be in the front nasal, flavor tends to be retronasal. Um, so volatilization of compounds, as you warm it in your mouth, you can, you can breathe it and hit your olfactory bulb through that. And that's similar effects there. And then the body and texture. So here's some examples of, of astringency. And I always tell um, people they should go home and make sure they understand what astringency is, okay? Just either you can buy some of our stellar tan, take it home, take a gob of it, put it in your mouth and have it in your mouth for a while. But probably the better thing to do is go get a green banana, a crunchy persimmon. Uh, think of some things that are known for being astringent. Some products that are absolutely known of uh, cider varieties. If you look at classic dry English ciders, uh, they tend to have uh, different varieties of apples that bring different attributes to it. 
Grapes considered a magic crop because it has a balance, it brings balance into a, a beverage on its own. Dry ciders rely on various varieties in blending to come up with you know, the, the right aroma profile, the right acidity profile. There are varieties of apple that are absolutely relied upon to bring astringency. All right, so cider is clearly one of these beverages. Perry, um, Perry pears, same sort of thing. There are Perry pear varieties that are absolutely built on astringency, and they're absolutely unpalatable as fruit, but clearly important from a beverage standpoint. And then here are some other things. Pomegranate, different class of tannins, but if you take the peel, the rind on a pomegranate, chew it, astringency. Um, what's this one again? No, it's, um, thank you, it's quince. Quince is a, another one. You got, in order, have you, any of you had quince paste? Yeah. And you got to boil this stuff for a while. Uh, and then part of it is because if you take that quince, as a, it's a pretty astringent fruit. Persimmons, pea, bananas, these all have different aspects of astringency. One of the cool things, a banana is a great example of this, where you, know, you take a banana green, you crunch on it, it's really astringent. Wait a day or two and it's no longer astringent. Guess what the tannin concentration difference is between the green banana and the ripe banana? There's no difference. Isn't that cool? The tannin's still there. It's just been dressed, right? And the same thing is with grapes. Tannins are made in early part of grape berry development, and then during fruit ripening, that uh, sugar is formed, organic acids go down. It's all these things that neutralize that what that tannin might be. And so a lot of balance issues that we see in a wine production world can oftentimes be tied to how ripe that fruit was. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So here's some chemistry. So there's two principal types of classes of tannins that a red wine is going to see in today's wine producing world. There's this class of tannins, and this is a class of tannins that's condensed tannins. Uh, and these are grape derived tannins. So anything that a grape brings into a wine system is going to be this kind of a tannin. This is an, oh, absolutely. Are condensed man made or do they occur naturally? No, they're natural. So absolutely. They condense on their own. Yeah. Well, and there's still a lot of debate as to how these things are made. So when we say condensed, in the early days, this position here, this four position, it's all the way down. It was thought of as being, there was a hydroxyl group there. And so they condensed. And so you eliminated water when these two subunits came together. So it was a condensation reaction. It looked like that. So they called it condensed tannins. Great question. This is a class of tannin. It's called, uh, it, it's an elagitannin. And these are the type of tannin that's prevalent in oak wood. So if, if you had a brand new barrel or you're adding tons of oak chips or whatever, you might impart sufficient quantities of elagitannin to give it astringency. Different class of molecules. Over time, this tends to be a stable form of tannin. It, it certainly rearranges and it's certainly a reactive tannin. This one tends to go away over time. And what you form is this compound, this molecule and this molecule, they condense together and they form a molecule called elagic acid. That's why they're called elagitannins. And so elagic acid over time will precipitate, tends to precipitate out on a wine. So if you like to add astringency based on elagitannins, that's the caution, is that over time you could form some elagic acid which might look like, so it would look like a white precipitate in the bottom of a bottle. These, however, tend to stay in solution. They tend to recombine and remix, and that's kind of the magic of red winemaking from an astringency standpoint, is how these things evolve. So more on oak wood. So if you think about oak wood and history of oak, um, originally, oak was relied on as a storage vessel, right? Um, so uh, if you go back before oak wood, a lot of wines were actually uh, you know, stored in amphorae and that sort of thing. And then at some point, you moved them over to the oak vessel. It was never intended to provide flavor to wine, but over time, we realized, wow, this is pretty cool. Um, the oak vessel provides slow oxidation of the wine, so you get slow development of that wine process, but it also imparts flavors, because in the process of bending your staves, you oftentimes will toast them, and they realize that, wow, if you toast the staves, you're going to give it some flavor, and that flavor actually marries quite well with wine. 
And so a lot of Oak ads these days are designed more from that perspective that, boy, I love vanilla in my wine or these whiskey lactones and the coconut character, some of those things. And they tend to go in cocktails that you know, bring in tannin, but it's the flavor that's really important that we rely on. The grape tannins that we uh, produce, are they're just grape tannins. And so there's none of the, the, the vanilla and that sort of thing that is associated with the products that we sell. And it's an important distinction uh, that we tend to drive on the oak side versus the grape side in terms of tannins and what they provide. Does that make sense to everyone? <clears throat> You're saying how many cellulose is with the wood sugars? They would probably caramelize it. During the toasting process in the bottle, <clears throat> doesn't that caramelize those and, and, and uh, I mean, excuse me, caramelize them? Yeah, absolutely. That makes, that makes them sweet. Sure, yeah. absolutely. No question. <clears throat> and you see that in these charred layers here, um, no question about it. So let's focus on the grape-based tannins and what we would want to do with the grape stuff. So here's our grape-based tannin. This is uh, what is, this A, B, and C thing is called a subunit, all right? It's a class of molecules called flavonoids. Has any, have any of you heard of flavonoids? So there's different types of flavonoids. There's anthocyanins or a flavonoid. Flavonols, flavanols, these tannins are flavonoids. And the thing that they all have in common is the same three ring structure. So what's different about tannins, it's polymerized. So that's the one flavonoid that is absolutely a polymer. The others are monomers, just one subunit, and it gives different things. So this here is a one, two, three, four pentamer. It's five subunits long, it's a pentamer. Tannins can vary in range from two subunits in length to 50 plus. And so huge size variation in tannins. Smallest ones, again, are bitter, right? And the larger ones are astringent. Not all astringent tannins are the same. They're all different. A dimer tannin of two subunits that's purely thought of as being astringent is going to have a very different astringency than a decamer or a 50 mer. They're going to be very different in terms of how you perceive them as being astringent. And that's important from a wine quality standpoint. We'll get into that a little bit. From a chemistry standpoint, I said these things are reactive, and they are very reactive. If you think about the two reaction conditions that exist in a wine system, um, one is uh, low pH, right? So under low pH conditions, there's a lot of re chemical reactions that uh, take place under low pH conditions. Wine tends to be from three to four pH units, and most of them is three, six or so. Under those conditions, these bonds here that are bold are constantly breaking and making. They're constantly cleaving. It's a constant process. So if anyone says, oh, wine is alive, I'm a chemist, yeah, I would say, okay, I can see that, I get it. Um, it's constantly changing, all right? And it's also oxidizing, all right? So wine is constantly being subjected to oxidation. Early in a ferment, we're giving it a lot of oxygen to make sure the yeast are happy, and then later on, we start to protect it. We want some oxidation, but not so much that it becomes hyperoxidative. What that wine system is doing under those oxidative conditions, tannin is a very important part of it, okay? So anytime you expose a wine system to oxygen, these oxal OH groups here, they start to become utilized, and they become reactive but the products of those reactions are more stable, and it's also given a wine an ability to deal with the oxidation. So the products of oxidation often involve tannins, okay? And that's part of that softening process. If you take those tannins, brand new red wine is pretty coarse astringent red wine, and then over the course of the year, that, that astringency tends to soften up because you're changing the way that this molecule looks, all right? And it's through those acid-catalyzed reactions as well as those oxidation reactions. You might get into it later, but as you hyperoxide a couple of things, I'm wondering if, uh, if there's any implications with regards to tannins. Hyperoxidation? Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. In a red wine world? White wine. White wine. Not so much because there's not much tannin. I just, well, um, if I add tannin, is it going to counteract my hyperox? Um, so in the hyperox world, I mean, what you're trying to do is get better color stability. I'm assuming that's what you're primarily trying to drive. And so in that situation, I would actually probably say that tannins are not such a good thing. 
the, the, the problem, what you're trying to do is create physical instability in the phenolic material that's in that white wine so that it falls out of solution um, over before it gets bottled up. Right. If you add tannin to that, it's likely that you will not create a physical instability and you just create color instability. It's just, well, I think you've got plenty of phenolic material in there um, that would, if, if you're trying to protect glutathione, you probably, do, well, you don't want to go through hyperoxidation, right? So you want to keep that glutathione in a reduced state. And if you add tannins to that white wine system and hyperoxidize it, it'll absorb all that glutathione. And it's likely you won't get it back. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, I suppose so. I could I could imagine a scenario where where you could do that, but I'm not sure you'd want to. I mean, there are tannins that are small enough in size. Remember we talked about bitter and astringent. And so as you can get smaller tannins that are small enough so that they're not terribly astringent, but they're not bitter. They're, so they're in the astringent world, but they're small enough that they aren't overwhelmingly astringent. And so you could add those tannins. And, and I'll, I'll be uh, I'm giving away the punchline here, but our tannins are selected a lot on taking advantage of this, this jewelry here the size of the molecule as well as the uh, uh, dressing it up so that it becomes less sticky and so less aggressive. And so there's some smaller tannins that we would have that you might try to add that level of antioxidant value to those wines while minimizing the astringency. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So if you combine the activity and the reactivity of these tannins, this is how we tend to think about tannins from a winemaking perspective. So this purple circle encompasses the tannin molecule as it is. It'll just uh, uh, It's together. It's a three-dimensional picture. As the grape produces tannin, oftentimes that tannin is rod-shaped. Okay? And if you think about the surface-to-volume ratio of that molecule, rod shape versus a ball shape, there's more surface to volume on a rod than there is on a ball. Part of the thing, when you have a great base tannin, it tends to be a rod-shaped kind of rod thing. And when we talk about astringency, it's very much a surface interaction. So it's one surface of one molecule coming together with another surface of another molecule. And so in this case, astringency, the surface of a tannin is coming up to our salivary proteins, that complex sticks together, it precipitates out, you lose your lubrication, and you feel astringency. That's kind of that process. But there's a lot of other surfaces that tannins would love to stick to. Um, <coughs> cell wall material from grape berries, wood barrels, um, yeast lees, um, on and on and on. And it's that same kind of thing, surface interaction. So we definitely rely on tannins because that's the sensory property we rely on for perception for astringency, but it's also important for these other attributes. One of our products, a, it's, it's a fermentation tannin. We love to add that at crush to try to reduce oxidative enzyme activity, so lacases, polyphenol oxidases, pathogenesis related proteins. Anytime a berry fruit is compromised in any way coming into the facility, it's a great time to be adding fermentation tannins because it inactivates a lot of those proteins, you're taking advantage of that surface interaction, inactivate that stuff before the tannins in the grape berries start to extract. So there's some time that you have a lag phase before the extraction of the tannins in the fruit start to occur. You'd like to make sure you inactivate those macromolecules that could be detrimental to wine quality on the front side of the ferment. So that's what we rely on from a surface standpoint. But then, as I mentioned earlier, acid catalyzed reactions, why is an acidic medium? We're constantly making and changing these bonds. Well, that's what is so critically important for color stability, long-term color stability of red wine. So making sure that the anthocyanins react with the tannins to form color-stable products. So we rely on it for that. Uh, those same 
centers that are generated during acid catalysis have the ability to deal with reductive character in a wine. So if you've got a wine that's got some H2S issues, transient low level reduction, tannins are a great system to add to that or in there, it will deal with it. There are people that do malolactics in the barrel with Pinot Noir that tend to be very reductive at some point in their life and um, that they, they can get reduced and you'll find that the tannins tend to deal with that system overall as long as it's mild. And then tannin reorganization. So these things, as I said, it's alive, right? This stuff is constantly making and breaking. We talked about that tannin initially being a rod-shaped molecule. As you do constantly making and breaking these things, over time, they start to change shape. And they become more ball-like in terms of shape, which means that the surface available for interaction declines as that tannin, quote unquote, ages. And that's part of that softening process that's due to this acid catalysis. And then finally, the antioxidant value of that tannins. Tannins are a great antioxidant, just like SO2. So they have the capacity to deal with oxygen. And we rely on that, right? When we rack a wine and deal, put it back in barrel, it's the tannins that are a very important part of that, dealing with that oxygen. And they can also be involved in aromatic preservation. Because of their antioxidant value, that wine has a capacity to deal with oxidation. So if you, if you have a wine that has a tendency to be aldehydic, you'll find that if the tannins are elevated, that, uh, that, that potential declines. Any questions about any of that? So very multifaceted, complex chemistry around these tannins that we rely on from a wine quality standpoint. Can tannins mitigate H2S or reduction? It can. Absolutely. Different centers. So here we have a center that's susceptible to acid catalysis. So that blue circle right there is actually the center that would be involved in sponging up reduction, okay? So you have to ask yourself as a chemist, how would I create more, I've got a reduction problem, how do I create more of this chemistry to take advantage of the capacity of this center to absorb that reduction? It's more acidic conditions. And so the more acidic the wine is, the better it is able to deal with some of that reduction issue. So uh, Yeah, so the only caveat to that is, you know, the chemist, the kinetics of that reaction are not like that, right? So it's going to take some time. And that's where it's more, we're talking more cellaring kind of a reaction. Um, the, the issue with the reduction issue, if you've got elevated levels of reduction, it's a race, right? It's a race to sponge it up into this component versus a race to form disulfide linkages. And if you start to get too much of the disulfide, that's going to be more, it's more reversible. You're going to reduce the aromatics on the reduction, but it's a transient reduction in the aromatics. And over time, as that system goes into the bottle, gets more reductive, those disulfide bridges will get reduced again and form more aromatics. Yeah, and, so, yeah, and screw caps, you know, that's where, you know, if you ever had any issues with your fermentation, it's not a good candidate for a screw cap, almost as a rule, right? So the take home on all that one is make sure you've got a healthy fermentation. Yeah. So this is just for those of you guys who are totally into chemistry. Take them home, look at these structures. This stuff is good stuff. <laughs> just want, telling you. Anything red here is a stable color. This is the anthocyanin that you extract from the grape berry. And these are kind of some of the reactions that have been characterized and identified in, in, in wine. Okay? So suffice it to say, this is what we're after in, in a, in a long-term stable of red wine. This is an uh, anthocyanin bound up with a tannin molecule, and this is an al aldehyde bridge between a mo tannin molecule and a color. These are stable forms of color. Elagitannins, remember elagitannins are the oak-based tannins. They can do the same sort of thing, but the trick is getting the tannin into the barrel or into the wine in sufficient quantities where you can take advantage of that chemistry. One other thing I wanted to point out on, I, I, I give this talk periodically and I point out some of the new literature on uh, what do we know about phenolics you know, that we didn't know five years ago kind of thing. Um, yeah, we didn't know this five years ago. It's, um, it's four years ago, uh, just saying. Um, this red line here <laughs> is uh, uh, perception. This is a class of molecules that was uh, uh, that just characterized for the first time like four years ago. And they're called uh, Leone, Res Leone Resinol. 
and they uh, came from uh, new oak barrels. So oak barrels give this compound out, and this red line is bitterness. These things are profoundly bitter. Um, here's concentration, 1.5 milligrams per liter. So tannin typical, you can get up to 1,000 plus milligrams per liter. So 1.1% of that, and you've got bitterness in your wine. So if you age wine in new barrels, especially like white wines, because of the threshold level is going to be lower, uh, there's some potential. You could p pick up some bitterness. And as of four years ago, we figured, oh, wow, barrels giving it some bitterness.